Welcome back. Hope you had a peaceful, happy meditation time. And I thought we'd consider the things that we've been reflecting on so far and take a look at the Karaniya Metta Sutta, which you might be familiar with, the Buddha's words on loving kindness. And I thought I'd share a translation with you that you might not have heard before. There are quite a few translations available in English. And this one um, mm. comes from the Nalanda group. And um, I also have, I think, one here, um, one from Bhante Sujato. And of course, translations are always an interpretation. You just can't really take either a word by word or even sentence by sentence and get exactly the same meaning. And any of you who knows more than one language, you know that there are some things, some words that you just can't really translate um, you know word by word or you know some some of them need a whole paragraph <laughs> to, get, to get the idea in another language so we're going to do the best we can so i think i might read through this first This is what should be done by those who are skilled in seeking the good, having attained the way of peace. They should be able, straightforward and upright, easy to speak to, gentle and not proud, content and easily supported with few obligations and wants, with senses calmed, prudent, modest, and without greed for other people's possessions. They should not do anything base that the wise would reprove. May they be at their ease and secure. May all beings be happy. Whatever living beings there are, whether they be weak or strong, omitting none, whether long, large, average, short, big or small, seen or unseen, dwelling near or far, born or to be born, may all beings be happy. Let no one deceive another or despise anyone anywhere. Let none out of anger or hostility wish suffering upon another. Just as a mother would protect with her life her own child, her only child, she, so should one cultivate a boundless mind toward all beings and friendliness toward the entire world. One should cultivate a boundless mind above, below, and across without obstruction, hatred, or enmity. Standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, Throughout all one's waking hours, one should practice this mindfulness. This, they say, is the supreme state. Not falling into wrong views, virtuous, endowed with insight, having overcome desire for sense, sense pleasures, one will never again know rebirth. Okay, so... This, um, this one is from the Pali by the Nalanda Translation Committee. Here's one from Bhante Sujato, who's how many of you have used suttacentral.net? This is something you should all get familiar with because all the suttas and the vinaya are available free on this website. And you can just find you know, which book you're looking for. There's a lot of information there, parallel suttas in other languages and all kinds of things. And this, and Bhante Sujato had, He's a Australian monk 
who was trained in uh, Ajahn Chah's tradition at Wapanana Chat and was a student of Ajahn Brahm. And um, he had this commitment to make all of the suttas available, translated in English free of, free of charge. So this has been his project to create this website. And there's a tremendous amount of an amazing resource. You can set it up so that, you know, you can include the Pali and the English together in the translations he's done. And then if you want to see a word, what it means in the dictionary of Pali word, you can touch it and you can go to the, you'll see the definition pop up. So it's pretty amazing. Um, as with most translators, I wouldn't choose the same words always. And that's something you should consider too when you read the suttas. Like what do the, what do the Pali words mean? Even if you just start to learn what certain terms mean and then you know, think about what you would really use yourself if you were gonna translate. So he says here, those who are skilled, first he calls it a discourse on love. So when he translates metta, he translates it as love. And I personally find that challenging because we have so many concepts around what love is. I think it can easily be misleading. So you have to get used to what he's saying here is metta. Sometimes I think it's better to leave some of these richer terms that the Buddha used untranslated so that we really understand what the Buddha said. Those who are skilled in the meaning of scripture should, follow, should practice as follows to realize the state of peace. So already we see, and we can see this in various translations that some translators translate this part as one who has already attained some peace maybe complete peace, meaning some level of awakening, maybe extreme entry, maybe even arahantship, or, or they translate it as someone who's looking to understand the path of peace. So this is how you should practice as follows to realize the state of peace. So in this case, and this is just because of the way the Pali language works. You've got some translators that interpret it one way and some another way because it's not really clear based on the poly. You can make a choice. Oh, does it mean you should or does it mean you have done it? It's very interesting. Sometimes I've seen monastics get poly names. Um, one that I'm thinking of was called Gunawuto, which means good qualities. And, our, and it's, it's cultivating good qualities. And um, when asked what the, word, what the name meant, he said, well, it depends. It could mean has cultivated good qualities or should cultivate good qualities. <laughs> it's kind of like day by day, you could choose. You know? <laughs> okay. okay, let them be able and upright, very upright. And that is the way the Pali is like, to be upright and then very upright, you know, really emphasizing that virtue. And what we saw in the other one, able, straightforward and upright, easy to speak to, gentle and humble, content. And this says unburdensome, easy to look after, um, easily supported. This is really a big theme in monastic life. We should be easy to look after. And sometimes that comes into kind of direct conflict with some of the other rules we have. So the monastic needs to be wise and interpret also, like what does it really mean to be easy to look after? And so what we wanna think about right here is, okay, I wanna practice kindness the way the Buddha laid it out. And this is how he laid it out. You know, that what's he saying here is it's not even starting with kindness. It's starting with our character. You know, kind of like we've been saying before, it's like there needs to be this virtue that we're developing. It's through this character, this character development, this virtue and purity that we're developing that that kindness is going to naturally emerge. And of course, we encourage it, 
but it's it's like the basis of moral virtue is fundamental. So there'll be a upright, able, upright, very upright, easy to speak to. So someone can talk to them about what bothers them. That's one of the hard parts about being kind, right? When someone's upset with us. I'm looking at the mom because <laughs> I've had, <laughs> there are probably a number of moms <laughs> in here or dads, but you know, when your child is upset with you, you're doing your best, you know, but you make mistakes and nobody, you know, is perfect for sure. And or any of us has this experience when someone's upset with us, it can be really hard to just listen as they, you know, express themselves. And, and this is what is the most kind thing to do when somebody's upset is to listen, take it in, not, not try to push back, not try to, I mean, I have this, I wanna explain. If you knew, understood, you wouldn't be upset with me because I had my, you know, I was trying, but it doesn't work really because if someone's upset, they benefit from being heard. And when we, when we can set our own kind of um, defenses aside, then we can really listen when someone is, is expressing their perception of us and our actions. And even if it's not accurate to be able to listen to them and be easy for them to talk to. And it's really, a, I think a pretty evolved practice to be present with and deal with whatever feelings are arising in us at the same time we're attending to and caring for them and listening to them and hearing what feelings are going on in them. Being gentle and humble, content, easy to look after, um, unbusy to not, um, how does it say it over here? Unburdened by duties. Obligations, having few obligations. Well, who's got few obligations? <laughs> you think, oh, the Coonies don't have very many obligations. They just meditate in the forest. Come visit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yes. Living lightly. That could be a whole Dhamma talk in itself, couldn't it? Just how do we live lightly on the, on the earth and among people? Being alert with senses calmed. Senses calmed, prudent, modest, and without greed for others' possessions. This one is alert with senses calmed, courteous, not fawning on families. So this is kind of like the idea of monastics being supported by people, you know, you're, you're not, kind of trying to get them to support you. <laughs> not greedy, not, yeah. Let them not do the slightest thing that others might blame with reason. I like this idea that the wise, uh, don't do the things that the wise would later uh, reprove that they could say, uh, that wasn't good. <laughs> You know, we want to be watching for that. We all too often are listening to voices that are not coming from wisdom. What's popular, what's accepted in a society or a group or a generation or whatever. Or we see uh, examples in the media or we follow um, people who aren't wise. So that's a very important distinction. May they be happy and safe. May all beings be happy and safe. 
And this one says at ease and secure. Whatever living creatures there are with not one left out, frail or firm, long or large, medium, small, round, tiny or round, visible or invisible, living far or near, those born or to be born, may all beings be happy. I think the idea is really wishing that happiness and safety and ease for absolutely every living being. And I was reminded of, you know, one of the things the Buddha said about his decision to leave the, the lay life, the home life, and, and seek complete freedom from suffering. And he said that he realized that if he sees someone who's old and he is repulsed by that, that's not appropriate because he also could find himself in that same situation, being old. And I think this is true for any kind of circumstance. You know, someone who's sick, if, if we are repulsed by that and wanna pull away. And I, I had this when I was a young person. I didn't know how to relate to people in certain situations. Sometimes we don't know how to relate to people that have situations we're not used to. And so, you know, those kinds of conditions, um, you know, any size or shape, visible or invisible, the ones we see and the ones we don't see, whether that's devas that we don't have the kind of vision for seeing or that's just people that were not within eyesight maybe it's kind of like you're either visible or you're invisible it covers every creature <laughs> you look at these ways that the buddha kind of identifies the different uh, qualities of something and he really covers the whole space <laughs> whatever the size whatever the shape whatever the visibility near or far born or to be born. Anybody here have trouble with the idea of rebirth? It's okay to admit it. <laughs> it's very common in our culture. Um, you know, the Buddha didn't require any blind beliefs. He wanted us to investigate and see, but we do have, um, you know, the reality that it can be kind of hard to see that. It's not like, it's an everyday experience, maybe like, how will I know? And um, some people come into this life just knowing that. I think it's past life conditioning and maybe some relating to what already happened, they kind of still remember. Some people have outright clear memories of past lives. They have no doubt. Um, I mean, I heard a monk say that once, you know, once people actually see their past lives, you cannot convince them otherwise. <laughs> it's just how it is and they know that's how it is. And that's what happened with the Buddha. You know, what he described the night of his enlightenment was that he saw thousands of his past lives. And he said with particulars, you know, the name, you know, like what he ate and his experience of pleasure and pain and you know, the way he died, you know, all these, these kinds of specifics. And, and people sometimes have those memories and it's really clear to them. And the Buddha saw so many, can you imagine like, that kind of coming through your consciousness, you know, like you're just seeing like what happened in the previous life, what happened in the one before that. And he, and he said, you know, obviously he was seeing the conditions and then what came next. And then he turns to other living beings and he sees the same thing. Only he sees, you know, I'm sure people, devas, he sees how they live. 
how they're reborn in the next life. He said it was like a hallway and you see people coming in one door and going out the next door and you're seeing what their life was here and what their life is over here. And it's that clear. So that's how he really, he understood karma at a very deep level. Or just completely. And he doesn't ask people to just take his word for it. But he wasn't making this up. He wasn't coming up with a philosophy. When he reported on the Dhamma, it was through his direct experience, his direct knowledge. That's powerful. I don't know of any other spiritual teacher. Okay, let's not go there. <laughs> but as Ajahn Brahmali says, the Buddha was had the great had the greatest spiritual mind of all time, and he's your teacher. Think about it. <laughs> it's great. Okay, so born already, waiting to be born. I know someone who met her granddaughter before she was born. She was in a temple and she encountered the living being that then became her granddaughter before that living being came into her own daughter's womb. I know it's a little out there, <laughs> but when people have those kinds of abilities, they know, they know what that is. Um, and of course, people can imagine things, but that's not, it's, it has a distinct difference from imagining. So we want to wish all of those beings well and have that, that love and that feeling of welcome and care for all living beings. May they all be happy. Now, this next verse is very interesting because a lot of times it's translated as may none deceive another or despise any being in any state but this translation by our bante sujato is let none turn from another it's like let no one dismiss another person or disregard another being and he's he has a reason for that in the poly and I think that that's really, I think both translations are important. <clears throat> you know, like, of course not deceive each other, but that seems kind of coarse given where we are with everything else in this particular sutta. I mean, kind of, we got past that part. We're able and upright and on like that, right? Or you're, maybe it's a wish, it's a wish in the world that we, that we not deceive, that people don't deceive each other. And of course we can wish that, but we know that that's not really gonna come to reality in the world. And, and let, not, let none turn away from another. Um, this, I'm just gonna say a few things to, just to offer for your reflection. It's like, what's the impact as we disregard other beings? What's the, when we, again, when we're, when we are um, not impartial, perhaps, or we kind of just leave somebody out, you know, there's, a, there's something there. And I was um, remembering recently um, a story that someone told me, I, <clears throat> I knew this person who had been, um, a pilot in the Korean War, Navy pilot. And he ran bombing missions over North Korea, dropping napalm on villages. And his plane crashed and he was captured. And I asked him how they treated him. And he said, given what he was doing, not so bad, but he said they they took him through the villages that he had just bombed. And what he had realized, so now this is a guy who lied about his age and got into the Navy when he was like 16 years old and got trained and, you know. He said what he realized 
is that what he felt was disregard for the people. Of course, until that whole experience and being in the prisoner of war camp and, and he felt his conclusion was that disregard is the worst thing you can do to someone. Just a thought. I don't know if I agree, but it's good to reflect, I think, how we impact in much, much less damaging ways, but just do we want to be more aware? Don't look down on anyone anywhere. So it's let none turn from another nor look down on anyone anywhere. And sometimes it's like um, despise anyone in any state. That seems also again, a little strong. I think we can find examples in our own experience where we look down on other people. And of course, like, that comes from a, a perception of self that puts us above. Like, who do we think we are? You know, the more we can see that ego arising and set that aside, the more even-minded and open and kind we'll be with everyone else. And if there's some condition that someone is in that we find really hard to be near, can we really observe in ourselves what that is, what's going on, our fear, you know, where does, where does that come from? Now, I was going to say disgust, disgust is an interesting thing because the Buddha says when somebody is doing immoral things, we should be disgusted. But it's always around that, it's always around behavior, virtue, or not being virtuous. What, what is it that matters in terms of qualities and characteristics? You know, like the Buddha was really clear in this, this sutta called, it was to Veseta, it's a Veseta sutta, it's 98, I think, in the Majjhima Nikaya, where he goes through all these different qualities or characteristics and beings saying, what is it that causes us to be distinguished or not? What, what really matters? Like, what's the state of your body doesn't matter? Whether you have money doesn't matter. Whether you have, um, like, fame doesn't matter. And then he, he goes through all these things. He says, gender doesn't matter. There's a translation in there that says ways of mating don't matter. So if you're gay, if you're straight, if you're whatever, those things don't matter. What matters is if you're kind, if you're truthful, if you're developing the mind, if you've got these, these noble qualities of character, that's what, that's what leads to being noble. None of those other things. So we have to be, pay attention to how we discriminate against one another. How do we look down on others? How do we um, perceive ourselves above or below or equal to others? And really just come back to the development of the path. And the more we develop those good qualities, the less we're going to be judging anyone negatively harmful or disregarding, et cetera. Though provoked or aggrieved, let them not wish pain on each other. So even if you're, um, you can bring that up again. Even if, you know, you are being treated badly, you still wouldn't wish anyone else to be harmed. I knew someone once that she said she never had a thought of wanting to take revenge on anyone. Never wanted to, the way she would put it, I never wanted to get back at anyone. 
And she said, I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> so we shouldn't feel bad if some feelings like that come up. That's all just old comma. That's just Repaka comma. But then feel happy with ourselves that we don't act on it. And if we have acted on it in the past, see the results and say, I'm not going to do that again. There's always a way to recover in the Buddha's path. He was all about rehabilitation. <laughs> Even Angulimala, the, the serial killer, mass murderer, could become an arahant. We can recover. There's a spiritual recovery path, no matter what. But we have to take it. So not wishing pain on another. And this part here, even though as a mother would protect with her life, her child, her only child, so too for all creatures unfold a boundless heart. So translators have pointed out, this does not mean that you protect everyone's life in the same way as you would your child. Like you don't run in front of the car to grab them necessarily like that. And you don't have the responsibility to take care of them in the same way you take care of your child. However, you can have that same unconditional um, regard and caring for others. Does that make sense? Does that distinction make sense? That we want others to be happy, safe, content, we, we can have that boundless loving kindness, that boundless kindness and wish for their safety and well-being. The way a mother has that unconditional boundless love for a child. With love for the whole world unfold a boundless heart. Cultivate a boundless mind. Um, cultivate a boundless mind toward all beings and friendliness toward the entire world. Above, below, all around, unrestricted, without any enemy or foe. If you have any enemies, think about what you can do to not be their enemy. If they are your enemy, that's their problem. But you don't have to hold them as an enemy. And that again has to be balanced with wisdom. So I love what I've heard that Ajahn Chah used to say, which is you have to know the animals of the forest. And you don't treat the tiger and the deer in the same way. Or the poisonous snake and the rabbit and that's the way it is with people. We have to be wise, you know? It's not like you put yourself in harm's way because you're so like, you know, boundless. You could be boundlessly coping for their well-being and not, you know, in contact with someone who's harmful. So if someone is angry with you and wants to retaliate, stay out of the way. But do everything you can not to foster any kind of hatred or enmity toward them. Try to understand that they're suffering, deeply suffering, and their, their perceptions and attitudes are not going to be helpful to them and hope that they will become happy and safe and awakened. When standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, so all four postures, without getting, being drowsy, when you're not weary, keep this in your mind. For this, they say, is the meditation of Brahma in this life, or another way of putting that Oops, wrong thing. This, they say, is the supreme state. Avoiding harmful views or not falling into wrong views, 
virtuous, accomplished in insight, with sensual desire dispelled, they never return to a womb again. They never again know rebirth. Any questions or comments? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that. Richard is telling us, and I agree completely, that the Buddha not only saw all those past lives for himself, he taught his disciples how to see their past lives too. And he did, and many of them could. And uh, Richard, I don't know the story that Richard's referring to, but he said that there is um, an, an instance where one of the Buddha's disciples could see back like 500 eons where the Buddha only went back 91 eons. Do you have any idea how long an eon is? I mean, this is just crazy lots. <laughs> and that that was, you know, even surpassing obviously what the Buddha had seen. I think the Buddha probably saw enough. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that the Buddha, um, as Richard is saying, never um, said, well, once you die, then you'll know if there's a, a life after death or not. It was like, look now, look for yourself, try to try to discover. And it's also really, well, and Richard was saying, it's not like other religions. So we're particularly talking about faith-based religion where the religion itself is um, glorifying belief without evidence. I mean, you can see that in some scriptures where it says, oh, it's good to believe what you see, but it's even better to believe what you can't see. And it's like, that's not how the Buddha thought. He really wanted us to experience directly for ourselves. Now, um, some people are like, well, I don't have those kinds of experiences. I don't have these kinds of psychic things going on. And what do I do? Am I just stuck? Well, the way I see it is we, we have in the Buddha's chief disciples, Mahamogalana and Venerable Sariputta, they're both venerables, I just, yeah, Venerable Mahamogalana. Mahamogalana had incredible psychic powers and Venerable Sariputta did not. And he knew based on wisdom. Now, how does that work? It's like one time he said to the Buddha, Bhante, there is no Buddha of the past who surpassed the way you are right now, the way your, your attainment or your achievement. And there's not going to be any Buddha in the future that will go beyond the way you are. And the Buddha said, how do you know that? Did you encompass with your mind, the minds of all the past Buddhas to see what they're like? And he said, no. Did you encompass all the minds of the future Buddhas? You know, cause there's that idea, there's a psychic kind of power of encompassing another person's mind with your mind. And I don't know how many of you have ever experienced one. I, I know in Thailand, there are monks who have read my mind, I can tell you. And you get that sense that they do that. They can encompass your mind with their mind and know, and know what's there. And by the way, whenever that's happened with one of the monks, it's always had this supportive, loving feeling about it. It's never felt invasive. It's always been with the interest of helping. And that's wonderful. Anyhow. The Buddha asked Venerable Sariputta, so is that what you did with the Buddhas of the future? And he said, no. Well, then how can you make this audacious claim? And Venerable Sariputta says, it's because I know the drift of the Dhamma. There's a, there's a knowing that has a different quality coming from deep meditation. Venerable Sariputta was an incredible meditator and he wisdom would come and it's a little like that when the buddha when the buddha talks about in that very first discourse of turning the wheel of the dhamma and he talks about kind of this 
realizing the noble truths and knowledge and vision arose in me, he says. I think it's that same kind of thing. It's a direct experience of reality of truth that comes through deep meditation, lands and we know it's true. We know this is how it works. There's something profound there that cannot be refuted or denied. And I know that too can sound mysterious, but that is the encouragement of the Buddha for us to practice deeply, let the mind go and, and let that process that is natural of the Dhamma kind of presenting itself in our awareness, in our experience happen. So the question is about my own history and that I was in working as a computer programmer and I also had raised my children. And um, I like that part about, yeah, well, easy for you to say now, but <laughs> how consistently kind could you be working in the computer industry and raising those children? <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> and what, what would I do differently if I had if I went back to that, or would I ever want to go back to that? So first I'll say that even when you become a monastic, um, you're not free from those situations. Living in community is no cup of tea or walk in the park. Or, you know, it's pretty really great with these two, but <laughs> sometimes living in community can be a real challenge. And, and the process of this um, picking up the Dhamma and using it was happening while I was still working in high tech and it was happening um, when my, my kids were, they were older, but I think the things that I would do differently are the things that, you know, you learn through being able to tame your mind, you know, and, and to be able to, um, practice renunciation in the way that I think renunciation is the most powerful, renouncing our habits renouncing our reactions and being able to hold the mind and the reactions that we might take verbally or physically because of the, the feeling that arises. So we're very um, susceptible to being kind of dragged around by our feelings unless until we get a handle on how we can't really believe in them and that we have the power, the ability to observe them and be present with them without acting on them. So certainly whatever we gain on the path, we would want to apply in every kind of situation. And I think, um, you know, this can happen while you're being a mother, while you're working in eye tech. And I mean, I remember being in meetings where I would be watching my breath and you know, like really getting calm. And I swear the meetings went better even if I wasn't talking or doing anything, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a, it's, it's possible. Um, and then to your question of, or would I never do that again? My intention, my aditan is to be a nun for every lifetime until Nibbana. <laughs> Any questions online? Let's see if I can. There's a hand up here. Just a second. I think, well, I've known you for a while, a little while, you know, and my wish for you is always that you find a community and you are safe and supported. And I think that 
know, trying to understand how to respond to people. I like your idea of signs that may be like, kind of like active listening, you know, like you kind of get a sense of what their concern is and you can like alleviate it with a sign. That sounds like a brilliant thing to try. I think this is a little in that whole category of learning about the animals of the forest, you know, like some people you probably can't get through to. Maybe there are other people if you listen to them and you empathize with their concerns that they might be okay. Um, I had this experience once in a monastery and I know this is not at all the same. I can't really compare because, you know, at monasteries, people ought to be pretty much on their best behavior, you know, so, but the kitchen manager got really mad at me for something one time and, and it was really, it worked well to just listen and understand and assure her that I was going to follow through and take care of what I had said I would take care of her, you know, that kind of thing. And, and maybe there are um, some percentage of people who are afraid of you and what you're doing that could respond that way, but it's going to be tricky. It's obviously tricky to know who is going to be available for that and who won't. And also this, this thing of what happens when we find that there's some kind of, I don't know, karma that kind of keeps that same pattern kind of keeps coming up and we're not doing anything to create it. And somehow we have to just go, okay, this seems to be the dynamic in my life. Not that it always will be, but somehow I have to bear it and respond outside the box. The box of course is Fear, anger, retaliation, closing down, whatever the response is, um, what's outside the box? And it sounds to me like you're trying hard and you're, I would imagine having a certain amount of success with some people, I hope. And I really hope you can park that van someplace where people are okay and happy and get to know you and care. That's what I hope. And yeah, I mean, the Buddha did not say that we should have to say thank you to the people cutting off our arms and legs with saws, <laughs> but not have the thought of hatred arise in our mind. <laughs> I mean, the bar is high, but it's not quite that high. <laughs> and, and what that implies, I think, too, is the Buddha was very, very clear and very precise. He never oversteps what he could verify through direct experience. And he's never fluffy. There's no hand-waving and all is nice, none of that. He's very clear, very realistic and very practical and incredibly profound. So if we follow his example, then for each instance, we have our own task of being very clear. And I know you're, you're trying, you're doing that, you're trying that. You're, you're trying to be clear about, you know, what's happening right now with this person as they come to complain about my being here or whatever. And the, the bottom line is your development of your own mind. That's what matters. No matter how many times people try to shoo you away or put you down or threaten you, what you do to develop your own mind is what matters. It matters now in the present moment and it's gonna matter the day you die and it's gonna matter after that. 
And if you can keep that in mind, I think you're, you're gonna be able to meet the moment, meet this particular person, try not to put them in a box and, and the, the, you know, we, we have these set ideas about the way people are thinking and what they're doing and try not to hold those perceptions too tightly this is something about people we've known in the past. They come and say, oh, that guy, you know? What if we let that go and see what that person's like now? Maybe it'll be different. At least be open to that possibility. I don't know if any of this is helping, but that's what I got. <laughs> Other questions, comments, complaints, arguments. <laughs> yes. So this this question is about more tools for um, being with kids and listening to them and really hearing what they're what's going on for them it sounds great. What else can you do and they're great kids, and in that moment, you can't feel that. <laughs> yes, so there's this great um, system called parent effectiveness training. And I don't know if it's still called that, but I bet if you uh, type that into Google search, you'll probably come up with it. And there are, or there were, I haven't been up on this in a while, but um, teachers who teach this, and it takes a while to practice it in a way that actually becomes more natural, but it's a lot like nonviolent communication, but it is directed at parents and working with your kids. And most parents come to the class because they want to get their kid to do what they want them to do. <laughs> and then they discover that, oh, wait, um, when somebody's upset, the right approach is to listen and to hear where they're coming from and what's going on with them and talking about how you feel rather than what you want them to do to be different. And so there's a, there's a lot of um, kind of shifting the way we see it and learning some skills and practicing with other parents and um, I would really recommend looking at that and seeing if you can find something around here or around your, where you live, um, or even just reading the book, Parent Effectiveness Training and trying out some of the, the, the skills and the examples, because it's, it's great. I mean, one of the first things they talk about is who's got the problem. You know, when you have a problem with someone, whose problem is it? And my first reaction is, it's the person who's doing the wrong thing, them. <laughs> but no, it's the person who's upset. So if I'm upset, I've got the problem. And what do you do when people are upset? You listen to them. And then, you know, when you express how it feels for you, you, you talk about real tangible, results like, well, I'm upset that you left your bike in the driveway again. And why? Because I don't want to run over it. I don't want you to not have your bike. I don't want anybody to get hurt. I, you know, and that, that worries me. And it would be really a challenge for me if something like that happens. And if they've already been able to express how upset they are that you just yelled at them <laughs> or whatever, you know, then, um, or you're the one who's upset, but maybe then you know how it goes. If we're upset and we are harsh or say, you know, get whatever, and then they're upset. So we need to listen to that. And if we're actually able to hear each other and it's, it's helpful to repeat back to them what you're hearing, because then they can correct you if you don't have it right. And you can also learn how to listen to their feelings and their what's behind what they say um, it's a beautiful system 
And so I would recommend it. And it completely falls into the same kind of thing the Buddha taught about speech and listening to other people. And, you know, the Buddha had these requirements for monastics before you criticize another monastic. First, you have to make sure you're not doing the same thing yourself. <laughs> And there's a whole list, you know, of things to pay attention to. And I mean, yeah, we really can develop skills. Yeah, you're welcome. Did you have another question? Make loving kindness um, your basis and really, really make it your meditation. And metta can be used as the basis for samadhi and going to jhana. Metta can be used to, to really um, be, you know, completely immerse you and, you know, really um, soften your heart. You know, it's, it's amazing. And metta can be used as the basis for really deeply examining and purifying your virtue. So you can do all of that. And um, you can do it, there are different methods, you know, some of them, like the one that we, you know, I used this morning of, you know, the, the chant uh, for all the Brahma Viharas and including the other Brahma Viharas is also good because they're all related. And I feel like the other three all have metta involved in them, compassion, you know, appreciative joy and equanimity, metta is always there. And so, you know, when you, I like when I do the, you know, the, the, the chanting of that text that the, the words of the Buddha, you know, I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And you go through all that. I do it energetically, you know, like I'll even, I'll even, um, you know, kind of like Qigong poses. You know, like really bring in, bring the metta in and fill the front quarter of your whole being with it. If you can feel that energy, I can feel it right now. There's like a tingling going down my body. And, you know, you can, and the next time you're imagining this, this right side is completely filling as you go down and so on like that. And just really embody it. Go, go, go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Anybody else? Anybody from online? I think you're right in identifying that what you want to do is spend some time embodying the equanimity and, and observing what it feels like. And maybe what you need is any kind of touchstone in your experience where equanimity arises. You know, like earlier today, um, I don't know if you were here, but yeah. I first started with, you know, reflecting on a, a memory, a time when you were kind. Yeah. And also it works, as somebody pointed out, it works to reflect on a time when someone else was kind to us. You know, that feeling. Um, and, you know, you might be able to recall a time when equanimity was there in your mind, in your heart. And of course, equanimity is most obvious when we're faced with a situation where someone is behaving in a way that is really unho unhealthy, un unskillful. Um, and, you know, this is where parents, again, uh, have a, a great opportunity for practice because we can't control our children and we want the very best for them. And so they often make choices that are clearly 
not in their best interest from our perspective. And so what's, what's helpful then is equanimity. And sometimes we can um, bring reflections to mind that help us come to that point by remembering that each of us has our own life and our own path. They have their own karma. They have their own conditioning that they came into this world with. They have their own path forward that we have no idea what really is best for them. Maybe there is something inherent in the situation they're in or the choices they're making that will help them gain what they need to gain. Hard to know. And it's like really accepting a situation the way it is, even though we don't want the situation to be that way. And just, you know, in order to really embody that feeling of equanimity, which is incredibly calm, and it's not depressive. This is what we have to recognize about equanimity. If we started going closing down or going down in our in our mental state, then we're not in the right place with it. We're not really working with equanimity then. We're working with maybe indifference or kind of checking out because it's overwhelming or something like that. And we wanna we wanna then give ourselves more loving kindness and care and work with those feelings. But see if you can identify an example of when there's equanimity arising. And it might work better with something that's not so close to us. You know, someone's actions in the world that we hear about, that we read about, that we know about, that we, that we really wish were different, that we see the lack, the unskillfulness. We wish for them to awaken to wisdom and kindness and compassion and, and virtue, but that's not what's happening. And so the reflections on equanimity are about recognizing that we all make our own kama and it's kama that we are, that from which we are born. It's kama that keeps us going. It's kama that is, that is really, uh, what we inherit as we go on to the next life. And to recognize that, you know, it might look really bad <laughs> for someone, but that can always change. It can turn a corner and it's out of our hands. So, so the only really, like this is a Brahma Vihara, this is the, the uh, abiding like the devas or the gods, you know? So this is where we abide when that's the situation. And in this world, there's so many situations like that. We have lots of opportunity to practice. So in finding any example that's accessible to you, that you can really feel, and you can have that even-mindedness, knowing, because equanimity is a wisdom factor also. Like almost all of these lists the Buddha gives, there's one or more factors in them that are based in wisdom. So the wisdom of equanimity is seeing clearly what it is and having a sense of what the consequences are and that we are, that it is not under our control. And then if we can have that even mindedness in any situation and notice how that feels, how that feels in the body. It's not depressive, it's incredibly peaceful. So super letting go, it's like, ah, uh, it's like this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And don't rush to spread it all out somewhere else. You know, all of these different feelings, these different experiences, hold them, you know, really work with them here, make them solid and clear. Know when you're feeling it and when you're not feeling it. And then, you know, give it time and give it reflection, and then it grows. Um, you know, usually you're, you come to a retreat or you come to a teaching and you, the guided meditation goes, boom, 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 and you know, you're back here somewhere like, what happened, you know, <laughs> maybe. And so just use the template and use it for your own timing and really 
let your mind absorb it and really learn it and know it intimately. And then, and then let it grow. Thank you for that question. Mm, yes, we haven't, we haven't been doing in person. Well, we just started not that long ago for in person Sutta study in Palo Alto, meeting every other week. But we are probably going to be opening a meditation center in Sunnyvale sometime soon. And then we'll be having weekly Sutta studies, uh, we think on Wednesday evenings uh, for in person and also online. We're going to give that a try again. Um, and see how that goes. And um, yeah. I think my um, compadres, my compadre here, might be doing doing leading that. And we haven't worked it all out yet. I'm all, I'm all, I'm going to go away for the Vasa to Ajahn Brahm's monastery. I'm going to get a full three months of supported retreats. Like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I think Gaya Chitananda is going to be leading the Sutta study. Hmm. Well, it's been a real pleasure being with all of you today, all of you online, everybody who's come. It's it's encouraging to see such a large group come together. I think we're getting more and more ready to meet in person. And it sounds like it might be very worthwhile to have a meditation center. <laughs> so we'll check it out. Yeah. I think I'd like to chant the Karni Metta Sutta um, in English, I think. Are you ready for that? So this translation is the one that's used in the um, English speaking monasteries in the Ajahn Chah tradition. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing, that the wise would later reprove, wishing and gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection, 
This is said to be the sublime abiding, while not holding to fixed views, the pure hearted one having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. And then a blessing for all of you. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Buddhas, may you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Dhamma, may you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Sangha, may you ever be well. And then we'll finish by paying homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Goodbye, everybody online.